your source for everything paranormal. Parax. Throughout the ages, history has been altered by word of mouth and the misrepresentation of those who might not have been present when some of the world's most significant events took place. Channelers Barry and Connie Strom bring through the spirits of those who actually witnessed or took part in these historical events and lets them tell their stories in their own words. Welcome to Channeling History, and now, here are your hosts, Barry and Connie Strom. Hello everyone, I'd like to welcome you to Channeling History. If you've listened to us before, you probably know that we're the only show where we speak to the souls that made things happen. We are brought to you on the Para-X Radio Network every Sunday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. I'm Barry Strom, your host, and I will be doing the channeling tonight. And I'm Connie Strom, your co-host. I'll be asking the questions of our guest spirit tonight, and he is definitely someone who made things happen. I would like to thank all of you that take the time to listen to our show, and some of you even to join us in the chat room, and your questions, as always, are appreciated. All of our shows are available for download on Podomatic.com, and the links are available on our websites www.spiritspredict.com and wordsofgodthenandnow.com Please tell your friends about us so we can continue to grow our audience. We'd really appreciate that. Okay, we always give a little disclaimer before we start our channeling because we absolutely have no idea what answers are coming through. So the opinions or statements voiced on our show are the channeled words of the spirits and do not necessarily reflect our opinions, those of the Parax Network, or our sponsors. Tonight, we'll be interviewing the famous Roman general and dictator Julius Caesar. His accomplishments include being one of the greatest military minds and changing the Roman form of government from a republic to an empire. His relationship with Cleopatra is really quite interesting, and we will be asking him about that. All of our shows are available on our YouTube channel. It's in my name, Barry Strom, that's S T R O H M. Or if you'd like to download them, go to Podomatic.com and just search Channeling History. We've started a new podcast, and it's named The Weekly Message from Jesus. And we bring you a, a weekly message from our Lord of faith and inspiration to help guide us through these uh, very troubled times that we're seeing. We post the new messages from our Lord on Wednesdays on our YouTube channel. Last week on Channeling History, we had a very interesting interview with Archangel Raphael. The Archangels are always great guests. They have wonderful energy, and that show is also available on all of our platforms. So when we begin Channeling tonight, Connie will ask the questions, and I will answer the questions in the words of the spirits. But as you probably already know, before we channel, we always start with a prayer of protection. So Connie will say the prayer, and then we will begin our channeling. God, please grant us your wisdom and protection. Grant us the knowledge that we can handle and keep us safe from all things that will harm us. Keep the messages positive and pure love. Keep us safe from our egos. We ask these things in the light of the seen, the unseen, and the honesty of God. Amen. Very good, Connie. Uh, I have really been looking forward to this show tonight because this is probably one of the most famous people that ever lived. So anyway, Connie, if you want to start with some questions, we will start our interview with Julius Caesar. Okay. Julius, first, I would like to say thank you for joining us. It's an honor. Uh, Would you like to begin with a statement? Yes. I was... In my time, I was a great orator, so I would be very pleased to start with a statement. I would like to thank you for allowing me to come through. It is a very interesting situation for me. I obviously never had access to all of the technology that you're using for this show, so it is very interesting to me. I was very pleased when the guides came and asked if I would be willing to answer some questions tonight. I am. I helped 
write some of the questions, <laughs> and I think that you're going to be very surprised with some of the answers. So anyway, Connie, if you want to ask the questions, we can start. Okay. Let's start out with asking, have you lived any incarnate lifetimes since your time as Julius Caesar? Yes. I have returned twice as humans as since my time as Julius Caesar. Okay, could you tell us about those lifetimes? One of them, they've always been military times. I reincarnated around, uh, I'm just trying to get my, make sure I have my dates right here. I came back during World War I, and I was a colonel, and I fought over in Europe against the Germans. I had an earlier lifetime in which I fought with the soul that you know as George Patton. And Barry, I think you know that that lifetime will have mean something to you as well. That was around 400 AD. So I have, I have returned twice. I always try to return in a lifetime that is connected to the military because that is something that my soul has wanted to do. And quite frankly, I enjoy being in militaries. That's good. We need people who enjoy that. Uh, could you tell us about your childhood as Julius Caesar? My parents were political, politically strong in the Roman Republic. I grew up understanding the problems that Rome was facing. I had a very good childhood. My parents provided me with a very good education. I had access to many of the writings and documents of the times. And it was a time of great orators and individuals that were learning how to govern and how to and how to satisfy the needs of the people. Hey, did you suffer from any illnesses as you were growing up? I did not suffer from any major illnesses as I was growing up. I was actually very healthy and I was very athletic. I I was a very good swimmer. I could run very rapidly and I used my athletic abilities to learn how to utilize the weapons of the time. So I know we'll discuss later an illness that I had at the, towards the end of my life, but in my youth, I was a very, very healthy and athletic person. Okay. Could you tell us what life was like in the Roman Republic back when you were a child? When I was a child, it was quite chaotic. The Roman Senate controlled life in the Republic. There was much chaos going on in the, in, in the Senate. There was much differences of opinion, and there was much civil strife. There were always wars going on. We were never able to successfully get, uh, defeat the individuals in Gaul. There were many people that were trying to overthrow our government. And it was a time where we never had any clear direction. The chaos was growing and it was becoming more and more obvious that the Republican form of government that Rome was trying to follow was going to be very difficult. So what was your opinion of the Roman Senate? I felt 
that there were many, many problems with the Senate. The individuals that were generally senators were from rich families and from families that had and from families that had political power. Many of them were very crooked. Many of them were only out for their own good. It was a time where the Senate was drawing away from what was best for the people of Rome. Gates, why did you join the Roman military? I had many differences with the individuals that were ruling, and because of those differences, I was afraid that I would be arrested. They had already stripped me of much of my of much of my family wealth, and I felt that by joining the military and serving in away from Rome, I would be much safer than if I remained in the city. Okay. You rose through the ranks of political positions. How did you win the support of the people? I always thought of the people first. I thought of my men in the military first. I actually tried to give retired members of the military land that was owned by the that was in public ownership. I tried to bring better things to the people of Rome. The people understood that the senators were in it for many were in it just for their own personal wealth and gain. The people also saw the standard of living that the wealthy had while many of the individuals that were normal people were quite poor. From the beginning, I realized that I would not be able to make any changes without the support of the people. I understood that under our political structure, the Senate would continue to have much power, and that it, they were a force that had to be reckoned with. Okay. Uh, when you were in your 20s, you were captured by pirates. Could you tell us about that? Yes. I was headed, I th- as I remember, to Tunisia, and we were boarded by pirates. We did not have a large party and could not repel them. So I actually became their prisoners. They tried to hold me for ransom. And as I remember, they were going to ask for a relatively low amount of money for my release. I told them that I thought they should triple what they were asking for. (laughs) And they were quite surprised by that. But they did pay the asking price, and the pirates did release me. And then what happened to them after that? While I was being being held by the pirates, I told them that once I would be released, I would return, and when I did, I would have them crucified for what happened. Upon my release, I did raise a number of troops, and we did capture the pirates, and I did have them crucified. Hmm. What was your opinion of Alexander the Great? I thought that Alexander was the greatest military mind of the time. He had conquered most of the known world, and he had done it by the age of 32. I was already older than Alexander, and I felt that I had not been accomplishing 
much with my lifetime to date. I made up my mind that I was going to devote all of my time and energies to becoming a, a great military leader and then that I would also return to Rome and become involved in the politics and try to lead the country to a better standard of living. Okay, how did you become so popular with the Roman people? Well, as I said earlier, I tried to do much to improve their standard of living. Rome was heavily in debt because of all the wars that they were fighting. Because of that, individuals were being heavily taxed. And much like you have today, the tax burden was being borne by the people and in most instances not by the, by the extremely wealthy. So I was always very, very aware of what I felt would be best for the Roman people. Okay. You're considered one of the best military commanders that ever lived. What character traits made you such a good commander? I had studied and read a lot about the different battles and military strategies. One thing that I demanded from my troops was good discipline. My troops, my legions, understood that it was discipline that would result in us being superior in all of our battles. I was also very lucky to have individuals around me that helped carry out my orders. In those days, there, was very, there were very relatively limited strategies. So I understood all or most of what I felt that the opposing commanders would be attempting. In my mind, I would construct how I would attack if I was the opposing commander. I, when I was the opposing commander, I would then set counter moves to what I felt was the best strategy. And most often, those counter moves were successful. So I always think the character trait that helped me most to be a good commander was determination and confidence that I would win. Makes sense. Uh, could you tell us about your decision to cross the River Rubicon? After I was successful in winning the tribes in Gaul and some in Great Britain, the Senate decided that I was having too much power and popularity. And they ordered me to disband my legions and to return to Rome. I felt that if I returned to Rome, that I would be arrested and humiliated. So I brought my legions, my legion, I only had one with me at the time, and the river Rubicon was on the border of Italy. When I crossed the Rubicon, the Senate understood that it was essentially an act of war and that there would be a civil war to see who was going to be victorious. Okay, so that, that explains why you instigated the civil war. 
or is there something else to it? I felt that civil war was the only way that we could overcome the problems that were being come, that were being forced upon the people by the Senate. I felt that what the country needed was a strong leader. And obviously, I felt that that leader was myself. So why did you go to Egypt? Why did you get involved in the Egyptian Civil War? I went to Egypt in pursuit of Pompey, who was the leader of the opposition in our Civil War. He had fled to Egypt, and I followed him in an attempt to capture him. The Egyptians realized what was happening and arrested Pompey and had him killed before I could capture him. So something a little different. How did you meet Cleopatra? I was I was in Egypt and Cleopatra was becoming involved in a civil war with her brother. Once I met Cleopatra, I was shall we say smitten by her beauty and by her intellect. I decided that I would support her and that would help cement our relationship with Egypt after her side won the Civil War. How old were you when you met her? I was much older than she was. I was in my early 50s. Will you describe her for us? Cleopatra was a very striking woman. While there were some that you would consider more beautiful in features, she was quite attractive. But the main thing that made Cleopatra special was her intellect. She spoke multiple languages, she understood the politics of the time, and she knew that her victory over her brother would be the best for her country. Okay. Uh, Did you father a son with Cleopatra? Yes, I did. I had one son with her, and it was soon after we began our relationship. Kate, why did she and your son come to Rome? I asked her to follow me to Rome. I needed to return so that I could solidify my political position. I was in love with her, and I wanted her to return with me. So did you continue your relationship with her after she came to Rome? Yes, but I had to be more discreet discreet with her. I was married at the time, and many of the senators were trying to use the relationship with her Many were actually ridiculing her and making fun of her. And they were trying to get the people to turn against me because of my relationship with her. How many years did your relationship with her last? Around three or four years. It was a very interesting time, and I was very much involved in getting... I was very much involved 
in trying to solidify my political positions at the time. Yeah. Would you consider her the love of your life? Yes, I would consider her the love of my life, but I don't really think that she shared that opinion of me. I think in the beginning that our relationship was created so that I would help her win the Civil War in Egypt. But she was a wonderful person. Do you see her now that you're on the other side? Yes, I do see her over here. And we are still good friends. Needless to say that when you're on this side, the passion is no longer an important part of a relationship. But I do see her. And she is still a wonderful soul. Okay. Uh, in later life, you had physical problems similar to epilepsy. How did that affect your life? I started having these seizures. And in my day, seizures such as this would weaken the respect that others had for you. There were some that believed that seizures were an act of the gods and would actually strengthen my position. But I could tell that I was losing a lot of my physical abilities that I had always had in my life. Do you know what the cause of that illness was? Now that I'm on the other side, I realized that I was having small strokes. And they were affecting me with seizures very close to epilepsy. They were debilitating at the time, and as I grew older, I was realizing that they were becoming, they were coming to on me at shorter intervals. Okay. Did you have any psychic abilities? I would receive messages in my dreams and I would have premonitions of what was going to happen in the future. So I guess you would say that I did have what you are referring to as psychic abilities, but I never acted as a seer or try to influence others because of the premonitions that I would receive. Now that I'm on this side, I do understand that my guides were trying to assist me and to lead me towards certain objectives. I think that a lot of my military success could be attributed to the premonitions that I would receive at times when I was trying to decide upon strategies and how to defeat my enemies. So I would say, yes, I did have psychic abilities. Okay. Uh, let's take a little bit of a break here. Uh, we'll be back in a couple minutes, and we will continue with our interview with Julius Caesar. Don't go away. Channeling History will return right after these brief messages. <laughs> In order for the light to shine so brightly, the darkness must be present. Tune in every Monday at 10 o'clock. 
the Dark Sun Rising on the Para-X Radio Network. From Haunted Road Media comes an exciting new novel by author Marla Brooks. Soul Connection, a deadly obsession. Two lost souls ripped apart by murder in another century find each other again in the present only to discover that the murderer has followed them through time. Can their love save them or will history repeat itself? Find out in this captivating new novel by Marla Brooks, Soul Connection, A Deadly Obsession. Available now on Amazon.com and at BarnesandNoble.com. You've no doubt heard of Tango and Cash. Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. Perhaps it takes two to tango. Well, now, on the first and third Thursdays of each month, there's a show called Tango and Friends at 8 p.m. Eastern on the Para-X Radio Network with your host, Bruce Tango. And yes, there will be at least two to tango on each episode, sometimes even more. There's going to be lots of topics and lots of guests you'll all know and lots of surprises. Prizes. Tango and Friends, every first and third Thursday of the month at 8 p.m. right here on the Para-X Radio Network. Have you ever wondered what Jesus and his followers would say if you could receive their messages today? In his new book, Spirits Speak, Channeling Jesus and the Holy Spirits, channeler and author Barry Strom answers those questions for you. Using his gift of spirit communication, he brings you messages from such holy spirits as Moses, John the Baptist, Mary Magdalene, Mother Mary, Jesus, and even Mother Teresa and the Reverend Billy Graham. They discuss topics that are important for contemporary life in these troubled times. Spirits Speak, Channeling Jesus and the Holy Spirits is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other booksellers. Signed copies are available on the author's website, spiritspredict.com. After reading this book, you will never again say, what would Jesus say or do? Welcome back to Channeling History. Now, here are your hosts, Barry and Connie Strom. Okay, everybody, welcome back. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I think this has been a very, very interesting interview so far. Yeah, I will tell you this, uh, Julius Caesar's energy is very strong. So anyway, Connie, more questions. Okay, one of our listeners in the chat room would like to have some more details on some of your previous lives. And you did tell us that you served with General George Patton. Yes, that is correct, in the 4th century. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, I don't know if I'm supposed to be mentioning this, but in that lifetime with General Patton, Barry's soul was also serving in that lifetime. <clears throat> so that was a time that all three of that the three of us were together, and we were all military people together. In my latest lifetime, in World War One. I, as I said, was a colonel in the American Army, and I also accompanied General Patton in the battles in France. So he and I have been together several lifetimes, and I suspect that we will be together again in the future. Oh, that's sad. That means there are more wars coming, perhaps. Okay, um, back to the other sheet. Uh, how many times were you married? I was married on three different occasions. How many children did you father? I fear... I'm not sure I have a definite answer for that. During my lifetime, I was with many different women. I had probably five or six 
different children at different times. I only had one daughter by marriage. As I said before, I had a son with Cleopatra. Okay, uh, we have another question from our listeners. Uh, did you visit with George Patton now that you're together on the other side? Yes, we are close friends. As I said, we have life many times. George is a military soul, same as I am a military soul. He is a very brave individual, and his military interests are very, very similar to mine. And my dad served under George Patton, and he had nothing but high respect for him. Uh, okay, another one of our listeners would like to know if you're part of Jesus' soul family. I am very high-ranking in heaven, but I am not considered a member of his soul family. He did ask me to return for the lifetime as Julius, <clears throat> but I am not considering myself a part of his soul family. Okay. Okay. Um, did you have an affair with Nicodemus the Fourth? I have always told everyone throughout my lifetime that I did not. But in truth, I did have an affair with Nicodemus. And it was a situation that the Senate attempted to use against me. So why did you invade England? The English lords were supporting some of the tribes in France against whom we were fighting. So I felt that a show of strength against England would be the best way to prevent them from interfering with our military operations. Okay. Were you going to appoint yourself king? I had considered it, but I had been appointed dictator. Now keep in mind that a dictator in those days was much different from the individuals today that take over countries by military force. It was the Senate itself that appointed me dictator, first for a year, then for two years, and then they did appoint me as dictator for 10 years. Now, I had thought about the possibility of establishing myself as the king of Rome, and the people would have supported it. But I was very content just having the power that the Senate had appointed and given me by making me a dictator for such a long period of time. Okay, so what exactly is the difference between the dictator and the king? I had much of the powers that a king would have had, but it is the perception. A dictator was appointed by the Senate, but a king would have would have had his family members follow in line of succession. The Senate feared that I would be trying to set up a kingdom in which succession of power would be determined by my family, 
or by appointment. Okay, we have some more questions from our listeners. Uh, Let's see. What is your view of the world today? I view the world today as being in turmoil. When I grew up, Rome was in turmoil. I am seeing the exact same characteristics among the people that were governing, are governing today, and with the characteristics of the senators in Rome. The individuals in Rome were trying to acquire great wealth and power. Many of your politicians today are trying to develop great wealth and power. I would point out that that weakness in the members of people that govern have been what destroyed all of the great civilizations through time. Today, you are living in very troubled times, and it will be very important for the people to appoint politicians that will do what is best for them and not what is best for themselves. Yeah. Okay, another question from our chat room. What do you consider your best and worst acts while you were Julius Caesar? My worst acts were some of the brutality that I that I forced upon the individuals that we defeated in battle. There were times that I wiped out many innocent people. I believed that we were trying to send lessons so that people would fear fighting against us. I think my worst acts were some of the of the brutal things that I forced my legions to do. The best, I did a number of things that I would consider the best. I did many things for the Roman people. I lowered their taxes. I forced the Senate to stop spending ridiculous amounts of money. I brought a military stability to the country by defeating the tribes that had caused so much problems in the past. Had I lived, I would have done many, many more things that would have really helped the people of Rome. Okay. Um, Were you warned that you were going to be killed on the Ides of March? I had a premonition that something was going to happen. I was not I was not sure what it would be or when it would take place. But I had had psychic messages to that effect. Why did you ignore that warning? The the information that I saw in my dreams was not definitive, and I thought that I was taking certain precautions. I never thought that the Senate would assassinate me in front of all the people. Why did you think that you could trust Brutus? I had been friends and companions with Brutus for many years. I felt that he could be trusted. I did not realize that he was going to be the downfall of my life. Yes, one of our listeners would like to know, was this ending of your life part of your life plan? Yes, once I came to the other side, I realized that it was my time. Okay. 
Uh, did you have an affair with the mother of Brutus? Yes, I did have an affair with the mother of Brutus. Was Brutus your son? I was never really sure about that. That was one reason why I kept Brutus so close to me. And it was a reason why and it was a reason why I continuously forgave him for things that he would do against my commands. I was never really sure, but there was a distinct possibility that Brutus was my son. Okay. Do you see him on the other side? Yes, I have seen him. We do not, shall we say, hang out together over here. And once I got to the other side, I realized that he was not ever my son. Okay. What were your final words on that nasty day? I was in shock when the senators turned against me. I asked why they were doing it, but by that time, they were trying to stab me. I actually died without any real final words. I know that Shakespeare filled in dialogue, but what he did was not accurate. Okay. So what was the complete reason that you were assassinated? Brutus and the others felt that I was gaining too much power and that it would destroy the Republic. What they did do by killing me was essentially to, re to, re to destroy the Republic that they felt should be preserved. Because upon my passing, there began to be emperors of the empire and the republic was essentially destroyed. Yeah. How many individuals were involved in your assassination? There were many. I think there were probably 40 or 50 of the senators involved. I know that after I received, uh, after I arrived on the other side, I was told that I was stabbed 23 different times by different people. So it, it, was, it was a large plot and there were many of the senators involved. Evidently. What did you think of Mark Anthony's speech at your funeral? I was pleased. Mark was always a close friend and ally. And I was satisfied that he applied, that he spoke to the people and that the people would respond. Okay, why did you leave your estate to the people of Rome? I wanted to remain true to the people. I had always tried to do the best that I could. And it was the people that allowed me to rise in popularity and to assume the supreme role of power in the Republic. I wanted to try to help people upon my death. As I told you earlier, I was experiencing these seizures and I felt that my time might be relatively short. So I had prepared my will so that the people would continue to, 
show love and respect for me after my death. Okay, what is your opinion about the play Shakespeare wrote about you? The play that Shakespeare wrote helped give me, a, shall we say, eternal fame. What he did do is he added dialogues that were not accurate, and there were certain other things in the play that did not follow my life or my assassination. But he did me a great favor by writing the play and bringing the attention of people around the world to my life. Do you visit with Shakespeare now that you're on the other side? Yes. We're actually quite friendly over here. As I say, I owe him a lot for all that he did for me. Are you surprised that you're still so famous after all these millennia? Yes, I, I am very surprised. But, once again, I think Shakespeare had a, played a great role into it. Okay. Um, we have another question from our chat room. When you crossed over, were you penalized for the enemy soldiers that you had killed? I was, I was shown that I could have been more merciful. You will find that judgment reflects the times. I lived in very violent times, and what I did assured the safety of the people of Rome. So in the sense that I was defending those that needed defended, I was not penalized. But I was judged for some of the brutalities that the guides felt were, were extreme. Yeah. Okay, out of all the things that you are proud of, what do you consider your greatest accomplishment? I destroyed a republic and helped create an empire that lasted for hundreds and hundreds of years. Had somebody not taken the actions that I took, the Roman Republic would have disintegrated like all the cultures before them. Yeah. Okay, Julius, do you have a final message for our listeners? Yes. I would like to thank everyone for listening, and I would like to give them a word of caution. Your political leaders today are becoming much like the polit political leaders of the Roman Republic. If you do not see fit to send individuals to positions of political power that will support and defend the people, then I fear that the evolution of your current democracies are going to be endangered. I hope that you see the similarities between the time in which I lived and the time in which you are currently living. You must learn to follow the lessons of history. Civilizations, since the time humans first walked the earth, have failed to learn that lesson. If you continue to make the same errors as humans made in the past, then you will, serve, you will have the same penalties as humans have had in the past. You cannot name any great civilization on earth that has survived greed and the quest for personal power. 
It is only by serving the people that civilizations can prosper and enjoy longevity. So I thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. I thank you for listening. So with these words, I'm going to leave you. And I hope that you will pay some attention to, to the messages that I've tried to give you tonight. Thank you, Julius. You are absolutely right in everything you say. Okay. Thank you very much, Julius. Another great interview. It's amazing how interesting these important people from the past are to speak with. And we are going to be continuing to bring you many more. Next week, I am going to be in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, offending, attending the, the fem, femino, Feminology Convention at the Aspire and Eisenhower Suites in Gettysburg. So we're going to be playing a show from the archives next week. If you're in the Gettysburg area, stop in, say hello. I'm going to have a table in the vendor area, and I would love to see many of you there. You can submit questions and suggestions for future guests through our email, channelinghistoryonparax at gmail.com. My seventh book, Spirit Speak, Channeling Jesus and the Holy Spirits, is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and wherever books are sold. It's also available on Kindle for immediate download. Signed copies of my books are available on my website, spiritspredict.com and wordsofgodthenandnow.com. All of our shows are available on our YouTube channel. That's in my name, Barry Strom, S-T-R-O-H-M. Or if you would like to download them, you can go to Potomatic.com and search Channeling History. As I told you earlier, we started a new podcast. It's called A Weekly Message from Jesus. It is incredible information. I suggest that you listen to it. It's also available on our YouTube channel. So we hope you enjoyed our show tonight. Thank you for listening. And please join us Sundays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on the Para-X Radio Network. Okay, God bless you all. Have a wonderful week, and hopefully we'll all be together soon. <laughs>